Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing our Fall of the Han lore series with episode 12 titled Adding Fuel to the Fire. Last episode, we briefly skimmed through the early parts of the Leon Rebellion and ended the episode by skipping all the way to Ma Teng, who is a playable character in the game. But to better understand the story fully, we need to rewind back to the year 185 when the Han Imperial Court first started to react to the rebellion. At the time, Bian Zhang was in charge of the Liang rebel forces, and their attacks on the capital commandery of Hanyang was starting to worry the emperor. Not because Hanyang was in any danger, but rather because if Hanyang was lost, then the next target would be Chang'an. And if you remember, Chang'an was the original capital of the Han dynasty, during the Western Han dynasty for roughly 200 years, before the Eastern Han dynasty moved the capital to Luoyang. So there were still large amounts of imperial tombs and palaces within Chang'an. And since Chinese culture is one that is extremely respectful to one's family, the tombs of ancestors, especially those that are imperial ancestors, were something that can't be put at risk. So in March of 185, the emperor ordered Huang Fusong, who had proved himself to be the most capable general from the counterattack against yellow turbans, to marshal his forces inside Chang'an to help protect the city from any Liang rebels should they be able to successfully take Hanyang and move out of the Liang province. However, Huang Fusong didn't get any chance to do much. As we mentioned in the last episode, Gai Xun was able to hold down Hanyang and force Bian Zhang to attack elsewhere. And even more unfortunate was that by July, another visit from a supervising eunuch ended Huang Fusong's career in the same manner that Lu Zhi lost his job, because Huang Fusong, very much like his friend, was one of these incorruptible servants of the Han who refused to give bribes. So in August of 185, with Huang Fusong fired and the Liang rebels shifting north instead of approaching Chang'an, there was a new debate raging on in the capital. One side, led by the new Grand Excellency over the masses named Cui Lie, argue that the best strategy for the country at this moment is to abandon the Liang province entirely, since the country was still very weak from the Yellow Turban Rebellion that just ended less than a year ago. Now, if you remember, we talked about Cui Lie before in episode 5, when we were discussing the process of selling government jobs, as Cui Lie was a renowned scholar and one of the nine ministers already, but he really wanted to become one of the three prime minister level jobs. And in his first attempt to get promoted, Cao Cao's dad Cao Song actually outbid him on the position that he would have been promoted to by paying three times the going rate. And if you remember from Cao Cao's father and son lore series, you would know that Cao Song didn't even want this job. He only overpaid to butter up the young emperor as Liu Hong's pocket was getting a bit empty after using all his personal money for the Yellow Turban War efforts. So after Cao Song bought the job, he would quit in a few months, so the emperor could resell the position again and make some new money. And because of this move, Cao Song got on the emperor's good side and was granted a favorable retirement stop in southern China away from all these unrest. And this is why we find him and Cao Cao starting out in the south for the Mandate of Heaven DLC. And for those of you who are interested in Cao Clan's lore series, it's just a one episode special about the father and sons of Cao Cao. Uh, I'll put a link in the description below. Okay, that's enough about the Cao Clan because we need to go back to talk about the poor guy Cui Lie, who honestly is not a bad person. And in terms of abilities, he was quite capable and we can see this because he was named to a minister position already, and the system had been entirely merit-based, he would have been the one to naturally get promoted to the Grand Excellency position. But since Liu Hong is running a business instead of a country, Cui Lie can't compete with a corrupt official like Cao Song. So after losing out on the job the first time, Cui Lie got smart the second time as he was able to pull some personal favors and beg one of Emperor Liu Hong's nannies to plead with the emperor on his behalf for a 50% discount, as he just couldn't afford the full price of 10 million wuzhu needed for a Grand Excellency position. 
The emperor finally relented, but was not very happy about how stingy Cui Lie looked. Well, the scholars who had always looked up to Cui Lie's skills now spit on his name too, because they see him as a corrupt official now, and even his own son would call him Tong Chou, which means stink of copper, as a derogatory term for someone who bought their job. So when he proposed to abandon the Liang province, many scholars, including the likes of the young and brash Fu Xie, came out to oppose him, and they argued that the Han dynasty have spilled too much blood over the last 400 years to just give up this land now. Now to be fair to both sides, the Han Empire was really in no state to fight the rebels financially. The Yellow Turban Rebellion have emptied the Han treasury, and the war-torn land has not recovered. And since it was right before the harvest season, conscripting a new army now would dampen the crop yield and the tax returns for that year. But regardless, the scholars won the debate, and right away the imperial court ordered a new army to be formed under the command of Zhang Wen to lead this new force with the likes of Dong Zhuo and Zhou Shen to launch a counterattack deep into the Liang province to put down these rebels once and for all. Now, although I didn't put his portrait here, at this time Sun Jian worked under Zhou Shen and was already a very capable commander, but sadly he had a very low rank and didn't allow him to shine much in this campaign, even though he offered very good advice during this campaign that was often ignored by his superiors. And in the early stages of this impressive counterattack launched by the Han forces, the Han army were basically fighting at a stalemate or losing slightly to Bian Zhang's forces, who were more familiar with the land. But in November, a chance meteor shower, which is also an in-game event, actually spooked the Qiang tribal men, who believed that it was a sign from the gods that the gods were angry with them. So Dong Zhuo, who had grown up around the Qiang tribes, knew that they would be fearful of this meteor shower, as he convinced Zhang Wen that this was the perfect chance to counterattack. So for the first time, the Han army started to show success in the Liang province as the Qiang tribe fleed in the next few battles. But the good time didn't last as Zhang Wen grew overconfident from their success and decided to split his force into six different teams to give chase to the scattered Liang rebels, hoping to end this rebellion once and for all. Now to save a little time, I'm going to skip the details of how all six of these chase parties would eventually fail, but the key takeaway from this last-ditch Han effort for counterattack is that all six teams lost, and only the team led by Dong Zhuo came back out of the Liang province in one piece, as all five other teams took heavy losses. So while everyone was punished, Dong Zhuo was punished the least here. And with this defeat, the Han forces took a big L, and there was not going to be any more imperial court-sent armies to come into the Liang province. But the Liang rebel side also has some interesting developments, as Bian Zhang dies to an illness in 187, which leads to a huge infighting among the likes of Bei Gong Bo Yu and Li Wenhou for control of the rebels. But in the end, Han Sui would end up winning this power struggle as he would kill off both Bei Gong Bo Yu and Li Wenhou. And after Han Sui took control of the rebel forces, which now numbered over 100,000, he would launch a new wave of attacks against the capital commander of Hanyang, which they were not able to take last time. And this time, the commander is defended by the new governor, Geng Bi, and the administrator Fu Xie, who has now come out west also following his fierce debate to a not abandon the Liang province. And working under them were two relatively lower ranked generals named Wang Guo and Ma Teng. And at first, in April of 187, the new governor Geng Bi would try to rally the remaining Han forces within the Liang province by asking all six administrators from the Liang province to contribute to a final offensive campaign against Han Sui, who he felt might be weak since they were just the infighting among the rebels. But the rebels were still very strong with their overwhelming numbers, and two of the administrators actually defected right away to join the rebels uh, to save their own necks instead of to fight with Gong Bi. And for Gong Bi's sake, he was killed by his own man too, under the command of Wang Guo, who also decided it was better to save his own neck 
and instead decided to defect with his troops. So at this point, the Liang province was pretty much entirely lost. As Han Sui was not only getting stronger and had the strongest army, but he also had control of most of the land. And to make matter worse, when Wang Guo decided to take over and kill Geng Bi, he also took control of the defected Han armies and used that same army to attack Fu Xie, who remained inside Hanyang Commandery, which had really no man left interested in defending it, as morale was at an all-point low, with everyone defecting. And generals like Ma Teng decided at this time that it was no longer worth his life to try to defend the Han banners, as he too decided to defect and join Wang Guo. And very soon, Fu Xi would die, and the entire Liang province is now officially lost. Now at this point, there were two major factions within the Liang province that's left, a mainly Qiang force rebel group led by Han Sui, and a mainly Han force rebel group led by Wang Guo. And these two sides decided to uh, confederate with each other instead of fight each other, as they nominated Wang Guo to lead their combined force. And in 188, their new coalition of rebels inside the Liang province, with Wang Guo being the leader, started to attack outside of the Liang province. Now, this is the first time after the major defeat of the Han forces within the Liang province that the imperial court finally sent new armies out west because this new attack now threatened Chang'an. So the emperor was forced to reactivate Huang Fu Song and Dong Zhuo, who were each given 20,000 men to try to defend Chang'an. Now, although there were some friction between the strategies between Huang Fu Song and Dong Zhuo's armies, Huang Fu Song still outranked Dong Zhuo and thus was able to force his more correct strategy onto Dong Zhuo's forces as they were able to beat back the rebels. Now, although they won, the relationship between Huang Fu Song and Dong Zhuo here became uh, pretty poor, and which will play in a role later down the line when Dong Zhuo takes over. But for the Liang rebel forces, Wang Guo would lose and retreat their entire force back within the Liang province, and they would remain there. Now, this defeat also had other issues, as many now see Wang Guo as a weak and unworthy commander of the entire rebel forces. So infighting broke out once again, and by 189, three different rebel factions led by Ma Teng, Han Sui, and Song Jian now existed inside the Liang province. Well, the Han forces were successful in defending Chang'an, they would no longer be able to launch another assault into the Liang province because the emperor would pass away in this year, and a series of political events inside the capital would once again throw the country into chaos. And because of these chaotic events that followed, we all know that eventually Dong Zhuo would end up taking over and move the capital to Chang'an as the coalition from the east led by Yuan Shao knocked on his door, which was the event at the start of the 190 start for the game. And this move of capitals actually had a huge influence on the Liang rebellion that was still raging on, as these rebels started to become more passive and obedient, since they were no longer a frontier issue, as the government have actively moved to their doorstep. And at this point, Ma Teng and Han Sui decided that since they were both Han officers back in the day, that they could potentially negotiate a favorable surrender to Dong Zhuo, who now had a large force inside Chang'an. And they were able to negotiate quite a favorable deal with Dong Zhuo, who needed allies. So Ma Teng and Han Sui were appointed to become administrators in the areas that they controlled. But Song Jian, who didn't want a government job, decided to pull his force farther west into the Qiang territories, as he created a small independent kingdom for himself inside this area for the next 30 years, as most of the Three Kingdom factions didn't really care about his existence. And this pretty much wraps up the Liang Rebellion, but this is not the end of our lore series. Next episode will be our official last episode for this series, as we will return full circle back to the capital of Luoyang to explore the series of events in the last few years of the Emperor Liu Hong's rule and the political Game of Thrones that will eventually open the door for Dong Zhuo, who is a rather marginal player, to somehow take over the whole country. So hope you guys enjoy this episode, and see you all next time. Bye!